link. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Yossi Shunner Show. Today we have Steve Baker. Steve, why don't you introduce yourself and tell everyone your ongoing story? Yeah, Yossi, thank you so much for having me today. Uh, really, uh, my my story is uh, not too terribly complicated. I'm obviously a um, investigative journalist with The Blaze, Blaze Media right now. And in addition to that, I have been a lifelong musician. I started my transition into journalism. Uh, I would, it, accidentally, really, I, it was something that I did for years as a hobby. It was then something that was kind of a side hustle after that. And then uh, because of the COVID lockdowns, it really thrust me into more full-time work on the investigative journalism side of things because I had the time to do it. Uh, being a lifelong musician for almost two years, you know, we weren't allowed to work, uh, weren't allowed to play live music. And so that gave me the opportunity to really step out and begin doing that more aggressively. That ultimately led to me covering January 6th and I was there. And then of course, <laughs> as they say, the rest is history. Three years later, here I am. Uh, and probably about 80% of the work that I'm doing right now is January 6th related. So you were there just doing journalism, just reporting Correct. what you saw, mm -hmm. not partaking in any of the protesting, not partaking in any thing other than filming and talking about what you saw. Yeah, that's correct. My, myself and an, another uh, writer, a friend of mine, a colleague uh, of some esteem, he uh, and I drove up to uh, D.C. together from Raleigh, North Carolina, where we both live. And then uh, we had no other intention whatsoever, uh, whatsoever other than just observing the day chronicling the day, reporting on the day. And then for me, I took my, you know, I had my camera, my tripod and my man on the street microphone to do some interviews, that sort of thing. And then what ended up transpiring was a shock to both of us. I, uh, I followed the story where the story went. And that uh, is and was my sole reason for being there. You know, and I, you know, I, I didn't wear any Trump gear, paraphernalia, ball caps. I, I, you know, I don't even own a, you know, a red Make America Great Again ball cap. And then um, uh, did no parading, no picketing, as they say. And then when the, uh, the doors opened and people started going into the Capitol building itself, myself, like about 60 other journalists who went through open doors and open windows, I myself uh, was one of those that did, in fact, do that. Now, consequently, I'm having to deal with the Department of Justice and the FBI as a result of that here three years later. I have not been indicted. I've not been charged yet, but they have been threatening me for over two years to actually uh, catch me in that dragnet of people who, quote unquote, went into restricted spaces. So you were contacted by the FBI initially asking for footage or I missed that part of the story when I was researching. Yeah, no, uh, they they contacted me back in July of 21. So just six or so months after the um, incident of January 6th. And so they wanted to do an interview and they had to actually get permission from the uh, U.S. Attorney General's office. There's a there's a statute in the Code of Federal Regulations that prevents a, um, uh, an invest a federal investigative arm like the FBI to interview a member of the press uh, or media without express written consent from the attorney general's office. So they had to go through that process. As a result, we weren't able to actually do that interview until about, I think it was in October of 21. And so we did that. And then in uh, November of 21, just a month later, my attorney received a uh, an email from the assistant U.S. attorney who had uh, uh, my case at the time, and we were informed that they were going to, quote unquote, charge me within the week. And that week would have been Thanksgiving of 21. And so I was anticipating having to be charged, arrested, processed, whatever the case was. And then they disappeared and we didn't hear from them again for 20 months until August of 23, August of 23, just last year now. 
And uh, then we got a subpoena for my videos at that point, which is a little unnecessary considering that I had voluntarily offered my videos to the FBI at the time uh, of the, my interview back two years prior. So they, they chose to go the hard route and, and do a grand jury subpoena for my videos. We complied. We turned them over. Uh, we could have maybe pushed back because of the, the media press aspect of that, but I didn't have anything to hide in those videos. So we turned those over to them. And then uh, just uh, this past December, just um, a month ago, matter of fact, a a month ago, uh, almost exactly a month ago, we got notice yet again uh, from the FBI to my attorney that they intended to go ahead and press charges against me and that, that I was going to have to self-surrender on the, uh, I think that would have been uh, about a month from uh, a month ago today that they anticipated that I would or was going to require me to self-surrender in Raleigh, North Carolina, where I live. I was actually in D.C. at the time when I got the notification this last time. And so now, as it stands at the moment, they have uh, pushed that back, as they said, to mid-January was the last word that we got from the uh, assistant U.S. attorney to my attorney. And as of right now, it's now past mid-January and we still haven't heard from them. So uh, once again, they've gone silent on us. But, uh, you know, it, as they say, the, the, you know, the process is the punishment. So for over two years, I've woken up every morning at, at six o'clock wondering if I'm going to get that, you know, knock on the door, FBI, FBI, or see the red dots through my window, that kind of thing. Yeah. Is there a way that you could sue them for harassment? Because I, you this know, is I harassment. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't, I don't think that, that there's any, um, uh, I don't think that there's any allowance for somebody to do that when they're being investigated um, and then being um, repeatedly told that they're coming after me or, or whatever. I don't, I don't think that there's any, any legal ability to do that. Uh, certainly none that I'm aware of. Certainly none that my attorneys have notified me. I have six attorneys working with me on this case right now. So uh, none of them have brought up that possibility. Uh, although uh, I don't, they may not be, uh, their specialties may not be in that area, but they're pretty, they're pretty well. I'll, told, I'll tell you what, they definitely know more than I do. In yeah. law, they definitely know more than I do. Mm -hmm. I just do whatever I can to fight for free speech online and uh, news roundup and the podcast. Mm. Uh, so you still have no idea what they want to charge you with. Correct. Yeah, we still do not know. They technically do not have to tell me uh, until they actually make the arrest or I turn myself in. Uh, that's what I understand to be the law. But uh, two, two plus years ago, when they were initially going to uh, charge me at the time, they did uh, give my attorney a couple of statutes that they were going to charge me with at the time. Uh, this time they're keeping that under their vest and not telling me at all because they actually, they literally said, or the U.S. attorney literally said that they wouldn't tell me because they knew that I would tweet it out the next day or the same day, which was, I thought was pretty funny. But, and you actually have the legal right to do so. Of course. Yeah, of course. But they also don't have to tell me, which they, you know, they technically have the legal right not to tell me. And, and because once again, uh, technically, until a judge actually signs off on the warrant, if that's even happened, we don't know. But until that takes place, they don't um, they don't even technically know. I mean, and that's literally what uh, the FBI agent who's had my case for two and a half years told my attorney. He said those words. I don't really know until the judge signs the warrant which is not quite very uh, truthful because it is the FBI agent and all of these documents, all of these, what they call statements of fact, it's always the FBI agent who does the investigation, who makes the determination if a crime has been committed, if there's enough evidence uh, to bring those charges or recommend those charges to the Department of Justice. And so uh, the FBI agent could have told us, but he, he you know, he went, the technical route and withheld that information from us. And now, of course, the the uh, assistant U.S. attorney who has my case is also going that route. I, I hope 
you know, I, I still I still wake up and pray every morning, you know, Lord, let this cup pass for me. I don't want to go through this. But if we do have to go through it, it's going to be it's going to be one hell of a fight. I've got a great legal team. I've got the backing of, you know, Blake, Blaze Media and um, uh, and look, all, all of the uh, I think I think all of the conservative press media, uh, libertarian media press are going to rally behind this situation. I wish that we had gotten similar um, support for other independent journalists that had to go through this battle without that. Um, a couple of other ones come to mind, like J.D. Rivera out of Pensacola, who was, I think he may have been the first independent journalist arrested, and then he ended up getting indicted uh, ended up uh, being convicted, ended up having to, um, he served seven months of an eight month prison sentence in a medium security facility. And in, in fact, he spent two months in solitary confinement um, for doing journalism. That's what he does. He's a professional photojournalist, had contract after contract. This is, I mean, he's a contract uh, photojournalist, was actually contracted with a television station out of Mobile, Alabama for that event. And they still threw him in, in prison. Uh, and then more recently, uh, Stephen Horn, another uh, young uh, independent journalist out of Raleigh, North Carolina, I covered his trial. I think it was back in September or October. And he was convicted on all four of the basic misdemeanor accounts. And then his sentencing hearing was last week. And thank God. Uh, the judge had mercy on him and did not put him in prison. He actually gave him a year's probation and a, and a $2,000 fine, but he did not get sentenced to prison. And that was the day after the Ray Epps uh, sentencing hearing. So uh, the the judge in, in Stephen Horn's case may have been a little bit rattled by that <laughs> fact that Epps was also given probation. Well, Epps, there's so many theories about this Ray Epps that I don't even know the truth anymore. Mm -hmm. And that's what bothers me now about mainstream media. The mainstream media, that's why I do my news roundup. I don't know if you saw my new, you've ever seen my news roundup. Mm -hmm. But I verify the stories to the best of my ability. And I've always said, if a story is false, I'll own up to it. That's what I do. But the mainstream media has become so disbelievable is that the word I'm looking for? I don't know. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, well, well, they're 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 unbelievable in their um, lack of accuracy. I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. Like now, th things are coming out that about other stories that they uh, that the media says false is actually true because yeah. the media is running cover up for the hierarchy. Yeah, they're either running cover up or their uh, their most useful tactic to protecting the narrative is to only tell half of the story. And that's what we've seen in so many of these January 6 trials is that the media mouthpieces uh, for the mainstream, the, the legacy media, they will only report half of what's happening in those trials. So in other words, they will only report what the um, prosecution is saying during their uh, interrogation of witnesses and then under cross-examination by the defense that doesn't get reported so we don't get to hear the other side so we only learn about the you know the the quote unquote dark side of all of these or the bad side of all of these defendants but we don't ever hear about the other side because they just don't carry uh, cover that some of that obviously leaks out because there are on occasion there are other mouthpieces in the courtroom and and watching these trials like myself um, and and a few others that from the um, alternate press who do manage to cover some, but really the, the resources aren't there for a lot of the, um, in, obviously, independent journalists, the um, smaller alternate press sources don't have the resources to have uh, journalists, uh, legal affairs correspondents uh, based in D.C. and on salary and able to be there at the district courthouse every day. So we just and because there's no cameras in the courtrooms and federal courtrooms, we're, we're missing a lot. I mean, a lot. So the, it makes it much easier for the legacy media to control the narrative that way. We need more independent journalism. Yeah. We need 
independent journalism is the only way forward. Mainstream media has got to go. I've been saying this for a long time, and I did a bunch of podcasts before my break about this. Mm-hmm. We need um, independent journalism. So, well, I will, I will tell I will tell you, you're exactly right. Uh, it is absolutely true, and I, I was told this um, more than two years ago that it was going to be independent journalism and it was going to be the smaller alternative media sources that ultimately break the big stories going forward. And because of the support, let's be honest, the support that we're getting from Elon Musk's version of Twitter, now X, um, there he is affording those voices a platform and a way to get that out in a way that we've never seen before. And the legacy media hates that that's why they're trying so hard to bring him down that's why that we're going to continue seeing relentless anti-musk stories from the the mainstream media because he is breaking their back i mean we're seeing washington post having to lay off hundreds of journalists we're seeing uh, ai is is really threatening uh mainstream journalism especially because look, seventy percent seventy percent of the work that they do uh, can be written by AI. They don't need they don't need to be paying um, exorbitant salaries to reporters anymore. They just have to have one guy uh, go in and and ask a question of AI, and AI will spit out a draft for them in two seconds, and then they just have to have an editor review it. So it, it's not it's not looking good for the legacy media going forward. And because of the tools, because of the internet, because of X, because of Musk, because of, uh, well, you know, I, I don't want to, I don't want to blow our own home horn here at the Blaze, but it's true. I mean, when when Glenn Beck founded the Blaze uh, a dozen years ago or so and left Fox News, he was told right then that this that he was insane, that he was he was not going to make it. I mean, they they flat out told him that it was the biggest mistake of his career. Well. The blaze is bigger than it's ever been, uh, and uh, it's growing like crazy. And they're bringing people on, like myself, to do investigative journalism for them, and to, you know, to show that which the MSM and the the older media companies are just refusing to cover. So, like, like we've been saying, um, MSM. I don't wish anyone bad i just mm-hmm. wish msm doesn't exist anymore and it's <laughs> only independent journalism yeah. independent journalism is the way forward i'm i'm okay with the msm existing just tell the truth cover the story don't hide anything don't don't all get together in their morning with their morning conference call and discuss what their uh consent uh, consensual narrative is going to be for the rest of the day or the rest of the week or what what it is going forward. And then we turn on uh, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, MSNBC, and they're all saying the same thing. They're all reading from the same script. Uh, we open up the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, you know, and, and they're all writing the same story. Um, and th- this is this is the problem is that that media complex, the industrial media complex has become nothing more than a mouthpiece of the existing regime. Uh, And when I say existing regime, obviously I mean when leftists hold the power, the mouthpiece of those leftists is in fact the mainstream legacy media. Uh, when, When the leftists don't hold the power in Washington, then that media machine becomes their enemy and it becomes the the um, uh, the primary source of disinformation and taking and the effort to take down uh, the the con you know the the other side of the political aisle rather than ju- you know damn it just report the truth it's not that just hard. do your job just do your jobs just do your job that's it yeah people always ask me I don't know how this fits in but this is where my mind's going people always ask me Yossi who do you endorse? Trump, DeSantis? This? I said, it's not the media's job to make an endorsement. The yeah. media's job is to give you the facts. Nothing yeah. but the facts, not an opinion, not anything. Don't endorse. 
Going a, a lot, you know, obviously for forever, you know, the, the major newspapers, local newspapers um, have made, you know, they will endorse a local candidate and they'll finally endorse the Senate and the, the congressman that the, of their choice that the paper's editorial board and staff feels is best suited to represent their community or their state or whatever. And then they'll make a, an endorsement of a presidential candidate. And, and, you know, as a, as a political commentator for years before I got into the more investigative side of journalism, I would, you know, I would make an endorsement of, of that type because I was, you know, doing commentary. I have avoided, um, because of the type of work I'm doing right now, I have avoided, you know, look, I, I, I have been very much on record for years that I've never been a, a a Trump supporter in the last three years, though I've been a Trump defender, if you know what I mean. If you can, if you can differentiate and understand the fairness of that statement, is that I, um, while I never supported him, I think that what's happening to him uh, from the weaponized DOJ, um, from the weaponization of the other uh, agencies, courts uh, around the country that are attacking him and trying to keep him off the ballot, I. You know, I, 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 I can find no justification for that whatsoever, not logically, not legally or otherwise. And so I, I am forced into as an analyst to just defend him. Defending him is not, is not supporting him. Right. I still would not support him. But that's, you know, I think that's where I think that's where maybe um, what we're lacking in all of media right now, most of media anyway, is just that honest uh, assessment. Look, I, you can, you can hate whoever you can despise DeSantis. You can despise, you can despise DeSantis for going up against Trump and still acknowledge that he's probably the best governor in my lifetime. Um, and you can despise uh, um, Ramaswamy for being too young or, you know, green behind the ears or too idealistic and, uh, but but you can still appreciate his success as a young man and appreciate his eloquence and all that. You know, so there's, I, I just feel like right now that it's not my place to, you know, to even step out and endorse a particular candidate. I'm just going to watch what's happening this time. This is the most bizarre and unusual election cycle in my lifetime. And and I was born during the Eisenhower administration. That's how old I am. But and this one is this one is just absolutely insane by comparison to anything else that I've viewed and witnessed or analyzed or commented on in my in my um, uh, my life and and in the thirty years that I've been writing about politics. So I don't I don't have any desire right now to pick a uh, uh, a horse to bet on. I'm just I'm just along for the ride. I'm going to watch this thing uh, play same out. Same here. Same here. Yeah. All right, Steve. Thank you for coming on. Yeah. Everyone, I hope to bring be more consistent with the Yussi, with episodes of the Yussi Schmidt Show, and um, stay tuned for February sixth, everyone. <laughs>